Hyonus parrots, also nicknamed the perfect parrot, the parrot world's best kept secret, and the couch potato of parrots. But are these short, podgy little birds as amazing as these titles really claim them to be? We're going to be discussing the facts and the myths, the pros and the cons, and what these fluffy little dinosaur descendants are really like when compared to other parrot species. Hello everyone, if it's your first time here, my name is Ash, aka Shiny Human, and I have had the privilege of owning two Pionus parrot species over the last three years. Quaffle, the white crowned Pionus, and Lyra, the bronze winged Pionus. During that three years, I've learned so much about these sweet little birds. Birds. And although I'm still learning, I'm always researching, I have found that there's not a lot of information about Pionus parrots online, and I want to change that. Most of the information available online is actually intended towards people wanting to buy a parrot, and mainly highlights the positives and the pros of owning a parrot, especially of this species. However, in my experience, most of the information online only vaguely covers the negative aspect of owning Pionus parrots or parrots in general. During my three years of owning Quaffle and Lyra, I have found that both of them do actually follow multiple of the stereotypes you do read and hear about when it comes to owning Pionus parrots. And at the same time, neither of them are anything like their stereotypes. They are very different in their own unique little way. I learnt very quickly that every parrot of any species is an individual just like people are. And even though they may follow their typical stereotype, majority of them do have their own individual personalities with likes, dislikes, and things that may or may not follow what you expect. So please keep in mind that while watching this video, even though we are going to be covering the general stereotypes of the Pionus parrot genus, that no parrot is exactly the same and not all parrots will conform to the stereotype. But what is a Pionus parrot? Before we get into the general behaviour of Pionus parrots, I quickly want to explain what a Pionus parrot actually is. Yeah, the word Pionus is actually the name of the genus, and the genus is a collective name for the type of parrot. Examples of this are cockatoos, amazons, macaws, and commies. Then from the genus, they actually break down into the different individual species. As an example, with the genus cockatoos, you have Moluccan cockatoo, galar cockatoo, sulfur crested cockatoo, umbrella cockatoo, and even cockatiels. They are technically a type of cockatoo. For macaws, you have the green wing, the scarlet, the military, the blue and gold. With Amazons, you have the yellow headed, the blue front, the orange wing. As for conyers, there is so many you can't name them all. You have the green cheeks, the black cap, the rose crown, the goldens, the Patagonians, there is so many conyers. However, there is a specific way to identify a Pionus parrot from other species of parrots. All Pionus parrots have stocky little round bodies. They all have short stumpy tails, not long ones, big eyes with skin around their eye rings and are often darker in colour. But the main giveaway that a parrot is part of the Pionus family is actually from the big red bump. Thank you. You will find all Pionus parrots actually have a red bump or red tail feathers around their vent or near their vent. Now there are other species of parrots that do have red tail feathers around their vents. However, Pionus parrots specifically almost only have red on that part of their body. The rest of their body is usually a mixture of greens, blues, browns, golds, as well as a variety of other purples, pinks, hues, and metallic colors. Currently there are eight known species of Pionus parrots and they are all native to South America and parts of Mexico. For example, places like Panama and Costa Rica. And several of these species have subspecies which have varying forms of colours and mutations. Now I will go into detail at a much later date about the eight different species and how to tell them apart or how to identify them, but for this video we're mainly going to be focusing on the five species currently available in the pet trade. I say currently available in the pet trade because Pionus parrots as a species are currently in decline, both in the wild and in captivity, and due to the lack of knowledge about them and lack of research on them, many of them actually don't get the care that they require in captivity. In the wild is mainly due to deforestation, loss of habitat, and also poaching. Something I did find very interesting is that each Pionus species actually has their own mini stereotypes. As an example, white crown Pionus are known to be more territorial, more grumpy, more aggressive, or more willing to defend their territory. They're also the least likely to get on with other birds and other bird species, but they're also the most willing to train and most willing to learn tricks. And so far, my white crown Pionus quaffle has proven all of these stereotypes she is extremely territorial and protective over her bed cage. She loves to train, she loves to learn new tricks. She is very intelligent and she is also very grumpy and likes to bully her little sister. 
Right now she's very eager to train. There's also some stereotypes she does not follow, but more on that later. Bronze wings pionists like Lyra <laughs> are known to be the most sweet, most gentle, the most laid back, the most easy to just live with in general. They are also the most skittish, more likely to spook, more likely to have difficulty getting used to new things, and more likely to panic fly into a window. Bronze wings are also known to be the most couch potato out of any pionus. Lyra, on the other hand, is a perfect example of how not all birds fit that stereotype. She is not a couch potato. She is not lazy in any way, shape or form. She is a little skittish, but not compared to other bronze wings that I do know. She is actually very playful very energetic, very brave and confident compared to other birds of her species, aren't you? I have to say though, she is the sweetest of the two. She has a lovely little personality. However, she is still a baby. And I will explain further into that even more later in the video as to why I'm disclaiming that she is still a baby. And baby parrots in general have the sweetest little natures. So please, even though your parrots may be a baby or under two years old, doesn't mean it's gonna stay that way. That's it. Bronze wing, you do have a possibility of them staying sweet in nature. We are going to be very eager to see how she changes when she comes into her adult stage. Again though, more on that later in the video. Blue-headed Pionus on the other hand are supposedly the most vocal. By this I mean they're more willing to make noise, more willing to make chatters. They are very drama queen. They are supposedly very bipolar, emotional. <laughs> One minute they can be sweet as pie, the next minute they're ready to kill. They are also supposedly the most confident and bravest of the Pionus species. Now I have never been able to own a blue-headed Pionus to actually see whether or not these stereotypes are true, but I do know a few other people with blue-headed Pionus. Some stereotypes they do, some stereotypes they don't. Where are you going onto the floor? Some of these Pionus fit this stereotype to a T and are very vocal, very noisy, and very drama queen. All the blue-headed Pionus don't meet these stereotypes at all and are actually very mellow and very sweet. Maximilian Pionus are the largest of the Pionus species currently known. They are known to be the most playful, the most toy orientated, and the most likely to mimic out of the Pionus species. By mimic, I mean they're the most likely to learn words. So hello, goodbye, what you doing? And the males even more so than the females. Now Pionas in general aren't very good talkers. They do not learn to mimic very easily or very well. So if you want a bird specifically so that it can talk, first of all, don't bother getting a bird because there's no guarantee that any species will learn to mimic you. But if you do want a bird that is going to start saying hello to you or telling you that they love you, clearly in a vocal voice, Pionas power probably not for you. Like I said, the Maximilian is the most likely to learn to mimic and even then the males are more likely to learn to mimic than the females but their voices are very raspy and very cloggy and not always very clear. Maximilians are supposedly also one of the least aggressive of the Pione species. However, the majority of people that have told me this have usually have got babies that are less than two years old. And personally, I don't believe anyone's opinion if they have a Pionus parrot less than two years old because Pionus parrot's personalities will change. Pionus parrots are also known for getting on socially very well with multiple people in the household. However, Maximilians are the most likely to bond to just a single person. Through my own experience, that depends on the owner and how well they socialize their parrot with multiple people. Back off. Unfortunately, I don't know many Maximilian Pionus owners. There's actually not that many, at least not online or on social media. As a result, I don't actually know if any Maximilians follow these typical stereotypes. These are just stereotypes I have read about, both online and in books. But unfortunately, I don't know enough to confirm whether or not these stereotypes are true. Dusky Pionus are known to be the most well-rounded. By this, I mean all the stereotypes we have just previously mentioned with just the right balance of each one. Now again, I don't know many Dusky owners. Duskies are actually the rarest species of all Pionus currently in, cap currently in the pet trade. Hi! And because of that, not a lot of people own them. Because not a lot of people own them, you can't get a good general census about whether or not this stereotype is true. Dusky Pionus parrots are meant to be sweet, intelligent, inquisitive little things and bring such joy and happiness to their owners. But due to their rarity in the pet trade, they are almost never for sale and even less in rescues. In fact, I've never seen a Dusky parrot in a rescue ever. Not only that, they're really hard to find breeders for, specifically good breeders. Breeders are a whole different topic, but let's just say there are good breeders and there are bad breeders out there. And I am fortunate enough to actually know a couple of good breeders who bred Lyra for me. But due to their rarity, dusky parrots aren't even available in the pet trade in the UK. 
I don't know of a single Dusky owner here in the UK that isn't a breeder. And even again, due to their rarity, their price tag is pretty high. Even if people wanted them, not everyone can afford them. In fact, I only know of two, maybe three Dusky owners in the whole of the world. And even that's only through social media. Because of that, there's not even enough Dusky owners around to find out whether or not these stereotypes are true or whether or not there is other unique characters about the Dusky parrot that just haven't been mentioned yet. And speaking of stereotype, let's cover one stereotype that is notoriously known for Piona's parrots. The nickname of being the Lazy Bird. One of the most common pieces of information you will find online about Piona's parrots is that they are very laid back, lazy, couch potato parrots. But what you often won't find is a little disclaimer that says when compared to other parrots. And let's be honest, when you compare them to a hyper cockatoo, a playful conya, or a very noisy Amazon, yes, they do appear very lazy, laid back and chilled. In the wild, Piona's parrots are actually known to have a very specific schedule. They usually wake up around dawn, which is approximately 6 a.m. During this time, they they start flying around, looking for food, looking for water, they forage, they play, they clamber, dance around in trees, hang upside down, they shower, they preen, they just be silly and really show off their cute little unusual personalities. And then between 10am to 2pm is actually siesta time, aka nap time. During this time, wild pionas can actually be seen napping, preening, snuggling together and just resting and regaining the energy that they used in the morning. In South America, where they come from, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. is usually the hottest part of the day. So being energetic, flying around, being playful and burning unnecessary energy could actually cause overheating, dehydration and even make it so they don't have enough energy to forage later in the day. So it's actually a survival tactic that they use in order to stay cool, conserve energy and save energy for later on in the day when it's safer to fly again and it's cool enough to fly in order to go look for more water and more food. And then from around 2 p.m. they resume their energetic activity. They start foraging again, looking for water, start playing, as well as getting ready to then fly all the way back to their roosting sites. Now our pet parrots aren't domesticated. They are still wild at heart and still follow all the same hormonal instincts that their wild brethren still use. And for Pionis parrots, this includes siesta time. So it's not uncommon to actually find Pionis to be more lazy, laid back and nap in the middle of the day. And it's this siesta time or this siesta period that gives them that nickname of being a lazy couch potato. It's just them following their natural instincts, telling them to rest so that you have enough energy to go find food later in the day. In the three years that I've owned Quaffle and in the year that I've owned Lyra, they've shown this behavior every single day without fail. Granted, they have a slightly different sleep schedule to their wild ancestry because here in the UK, we have daylight savings time and the constant weather changes as well as the shift from spring to summer summer to autumn, etc. So unlike their wild brethren, dawn changes every single day and sundown changes every single day. So we have to try and keep it as close to that natural schedule as we can. Now Quaffle actually likes her sleep and as a result of that, she has a slightly longer sleep schedule than most of the parrots. She actually sleeps on average 13 to 14 hours a day and that is her preference. She likes to be woke up around half past eight, nine o'clock and she likes to go to sleep around seven. Lyra has also developed this habit due to having to go to bed at the same time as Quaffle. But even even with this slightly longer sleep schedule, they still have a minimum of two hours worth of siesta time in the middle of the day where they nap and rest and regain their energy. Now, some people see this as a negative thing that the Pionas are lazy, they're not very entertaining, they're not very engaging because of this laid back attitude they have during siesta time. But personally, I find it one of the best traits about Pionas parrots. I have friends with all sorts of species of parrots from cockatiels, macaws, conyers, both big and small, Amazons, greys, you name it, I probably know someone that owns it. And while all their parrots are amazing, they love cuddles, they love doing tricks, they like to play, they're clowns, they're silly, or getting into things they shouldn't, like peeling paint off the roof. Yes, I know several macaws who have done that. One thing they all have in common is that activity does not stop. Ever. Their birds have to be constantly engaged, constantly mentally stimulated, constantly physically stimulated in some way, shape or form, which makes living with those species very full on and very demanding, which is true for any parrot, but more so with some species than with others. Whereas thanks to a Pionis's natural siesta sleep cycle, I can actually go to work for two to three hours a day without worrying that they're bored because I know they're just at home, literally napping. Or if I'm working from home, I know I have that three to four hours in the middle of every day where the girls aren't gonna bother 
bother me. They're actually having siesta time right now. During siesta time, I can work peacefully knowing that they're not going to be biting at my ears or trying to rip the keys out of my keyboard or trying to eat my pens or pencils. There isn't any screaming, there isn't any shouting. It's just quiet. Not perfectly quiet. They'll just sit on their perch by the window or sit on the perch near the chair or sit on my shoulder and just chill and be happy and there's no screaming or anything. Speaking of screaming... I've lost track of how many times people have asked me on social media or in the chat forums or online in general, are Pionus parrots quiet? That's like the number one question. Are they really loud? Are they really noisy? Do they make good apartment parrots? Are they going to shut up and not scream? Do they scream? Do they make noise? And almost everywhere online you will see websites and blogs and forums and posts about how these birds are wonderful wonderful, quiet birds. And heck, even I said in the very last chapter how these birds will just sit and chill quietly on my shoulder while I work during siesta time. But are Pionus parrots really as quiet as everyone claims? Yes, they are. <laughs> they never scream. Down your ear. Right. Or make noise. Ever. The truth is there isn't a parrot alive that doesn't make noise or is loud in some way, shape or form. Don't forget a parrot's contact call is designed to be heard up to half a mile away through trees and leaves and branches, if not more. Yeah! Plata! Plata! And this is so they can keep in touch with their flock mates over long distances so that they don't get lost or get separated from their flock. Because parrots are still wild animals at heart, they don't understand that they don't need to scream their heart out in order to let you know where they are or to find out where you are. Believe it or not, parrots make noises for all sorts of different reasons as well as to communicate. One of the ways parrots actually use vocalizations and contact calls is to identify imposters or other parrots trying to sneak into their flock. In fact, each parrot flock actually has its own accent, if you will, and uses a variety of unique calls and vocalizations to identify if another parrot is a genuine flock member or a potential stranger trying to see if they can nuzzle in on the flock and steal some of their food. Okay, not necessarily steal from their food, but you get the idea. <laughs> And this is also one of the reasons that a lot of parrot species will actually mimic their owners or learn to talk is because they are creating a language with you. And in a way is actually great because it means that the bird recognizes you as a member of its flock and it is trying to work out what calls and vocalizations to use so that they can identify you from Joe Malone down the road. And in fact, if you actually go out and get a hat or a new hairstyle or look different in some way, shape or form, you can actually use these unique calls and vocalizations vocalizations that you've created with your parrot so that they can realize you are still the same person even if you don't look the same. Unlike dogs that go off sense of smell in order to identify someone they know, parrots are mainly sight birds. They actually have a really bad sense of smell and mainly rely on their ears and their eyes. So if you look different, they use their ears to recognize you. If you sound different, they use their eyes to try to recognize you. If you do look different in some way, shape or form, one of the best things you can actually do is just talk to your parrots in the best way that you can and they will soon learn or realize that it is you and not an imposter. So as you can see, vocalizations, noise, and sound are very important for parrots in general. And it's why no parrot is truly quiet because they need these vocalizations and noises and sounds in order to identify their flock as well as keep in touch with them. And as we've said several times now, Pionus are still wild at heart. They still think they're living in the forest and need to scream halfway down the street in order to let you know they're still alive. Majority of the time when anyone, including myself, says that a Pionus parrot is quiet, I'm still referring to that little disclaimer I mentioned earlier 
when compared to other species or when compared to other parrots. Because Pionus parrots are quiet birds when in comparison with a macaw, a cockatoo, an Amazon. And there's also a very distinct difference between noise and loudness. Pionus parrots in general are not noisy. They tend to make little chirps and squeaks through the day, which you can probably hear quaffle making in the background or lyra making in the background from time to time, compared to an Amazon, which stereotypically makes noise throughout the day, or a Konya that chirps, or a Budgie that makes noise all day long, or a Macaw that just screams randomly throughout the day. That's what you would class as noise. It's a constant sound throughout the day. This one. All day long. Squeaky squeakoos. Because of this, Pionus parrots are considered quiet because they don't make constant noise throughout the day. And this is partially due to their siesta time that they have in the middle of the day. In fact, Quaffle is being a perfect example right now of how Pionus parrots aren't always quiet. And like I said, not all parrots fit the stereotype. Just because Pionus parrots are stereotypically quiet doesn't mean that all of them are. Excuse me, madam. I am trying to talk here and you are disturbing us again. Quaffle is actually a perfect example of how Pionus parrots, even though stereotypically are quiet, are not always quiet. Some birds just generally like the sound of their own voice and will make noise all day long. Now Quaffle is usually quite quiet compared to Lyra. Lyra is actually the one that usually makes more vocalizations and more cute sounds and whistles. However, Quaffle is the noisier one because her noises are higher in volume when she does get going. Whereas the loudness refers to the volume of the noise. Now I can guarantee you've all heard the sound of a macaw or a cockatoo when they get going and when they scream, they are very, very loud birds. And even though Pionus parrots are quiet, in general throughout the day, they are extremely loud birds. The loudness can either refer to the volume or the pitch of a bird's call. And when I say Pionus are loud, I mean they are ear piercing. Thanks. Ear ringing, titanous level loud. Under the sea, down where to take it from me. Pionus parrots have two main calls. They have their contact or excited call, which is a very, very high pitch squeak. Now the sun is laid away. And it genuinely really hurts the ear when it goes right down the middle and it's not uncommon for me to lose my hearing for a few seconds when they do it. And that particular high pitched squeak is far louder than most Konya calls. And they also have a danger call. This is a very, very high, usually double shriek that they make when they see potential danger, when they're scared, when something spooks them, or they feel generally wary. However, some Pionus parrots, like a certain madam in this household, don't just use this particular screen when they spot danger, but also when they're overstimulated or overexcited. For example, when she's getting a shower. And again, if you are unfortunate enough to actually have this particular excited danger screen down your ear at any point, prepare to lose your hearing for a few seconds or more. The general rule of thumb is the noisier the household, the noisier the parrot, as they will try to compete with the other noises and sounds in the household. So the more noise and the more sound that's going on within the household, the more the parrot will try and compete with that. Or they might just be like Quaffle and enjoy the sound of their own voice and scream anytime they get excited or overstimulated. Right now it's fuss times apparently. I can personally handle one or two odd screams. However, my friends, Fruity Flock, who have a black cat Konya and two green cheese, Conyers, they really can't handle just how high pitched and loud a Pionus scream really is. It is far too ear piercing and their ears are far too sensitive to handle the pitch. If you are considering getting a Pionus parrot, please consider whether or not you can handle the pitch and the volume of their screams. When it's straight down your ear hole and literally makes your eardrum vibrate, it hurts like crazy. The annoying thing is the camera can't actually pick up just how loud their screams actually are, but thankfully you can use tell by their body language whether or not they are going to scream. Which brings us quite nicely onto our next topic. 
one of the things I love about Piona's parrots is their body language. They are so easy to read and understand compared to some other species. Amazons, for example, depending on whether or not they're overexcited or angry, have the exact same body language for both stimuli, whereas Pionas have very visible different body language. Most Pionas parrots will actually give you multiple visual cues or signs of body language to let you know how they're feeling or what they want. And believe me when I say, as a parrot owner, learning your parrot's body language is one of the hardest and most important things you will ever learn, because that can be the difference between you having a wonderful, peaceful, loving relationship with your parrot and getting bitten. Snuggles like crazy. Second I turn my phone on, bites me. In fact, one of the hardest things for an owner is learning their own parrot's individual body language. Because even though all parrots of different genuses or same genuses have extremely similar body language, each one again has their own accent, if you will. And it's learning, like Waffle, what it is they want and being able to adapt to that. So the fact that Piona's parrot body language is so easy to read makes it a lot easier for me as a parrot owner. Challenging thing then is that not every species has the same body language and as a result, just because I can read their body language really easily, I cannot read the body language of a Konya or a Makor or a Cockatoo because they have completely different body language and completely different visual cues. So make sure that regardless of what species of parrot you end up getting, if it is a Pionus or not, that you learn that particular bird's body language. You because believe me, if you don't learn their body language and they are trying to warn you and you ignore that warning, you will get bitten. Which brings us again onto our next subject. Let me start this section by saying this. If it has teeth, it can bite. If it has a beak, it can bite. If it has fangs, it can bite. If it has a mouth with no teeth but a solid enough jawbone, it can still bite. Iona's parrots are no different. They have beaks, so they do have the ability to bite. But there is a bit of a silver lining. As I previously mentioned before, watching a parrot's body language is one of the most important things you can physically do. That can tell you what mood the bird is in, how it's feeling, and it can tell you if the bird is feeling in a bad enough mood that it wants you to back off and leave it alone and if you don't it will bite you. The birds do communicate this, they will warn you when they are threatening to bite. For example, if I'm watching Quaffle well enough, I know exactly when she's going to bite me or when she's potentially going to bite me and because I know this, this is when I give her her space or try and find the trigger for the reason of her anger and remove that source of trigger. By doing so, this calms her down and reduces the chance of biting. And let's be honest, no one is perfect. When I first brought Quaffle home, I I didn't understand the importance of body language and not only that, I hadn't learnt her specific body language or her species' specific body language. I was still learning and still am learning every single day. But because I didn't know that information, I got bitten a lot. And I got bitten even more so during her hormonal transition as she started to mature. But Piona's parrots in general actually have quite soft, delicate beaks and don't bite down that hard compared to other parrots. If Quaffle has ever bitten me because I've not been watching her body language and not interpreted what was gonna happen, Nine times out of ten, she only indents my skin or causes minor bruising. She's very, very rarely broken the skin. In fact, I can actually count on one hand how many times she's made me bleed. Compared to several of my friends who have macaws and Amazons and cockatoos, who I've lost count of how many photos I've seen now where their birds have drawn blood when they've eventually bitten down. But thankfully, Pionas prefer to warn you. They like to give you a chance to realize your mistake before getting you to receive the consequences. So by learning their body language, you can actually reduce the amount of times you get bitten on a regular basis. Pionas are quite forgiving species and don't tend to hold a grudge like cockatoos and Amazons do. I've lost count of how many mistakes or things I've done wrong to quaffle over the years and she's forgiven me for every single one of them. She's never held a grudge, she's never held it against me and she's never become fearful of me because of it. Now I'm not saying to intentionally make these mistakes with your parrot, I'm just saying that as a species, Pionas are tend to be rather forgiving for the people they care about. As an example, on the handful of times that I've actually had to tell Quaffle because she's had to get her nails clipped or whether or not she's got something stuck in her nose or I've had to check to see if she's got an injury, I usually have to tell her for her safety to make sure that I can get a good look at her depending on what it is. And during the toweling process, even though I'm the one toweling her and I'm the one holding her with the and checking her over and doing things that she's not liking and she's 
very, very visibly telling me she doesn't like. As soon as that towel comes off, she's my best friend again. She doesn't hold it against me, the fact that I just locked her in a towel for the last five minutes. Now don't get me wrong, just by learning their body language isn't going to mean you never get bitten. After all, there may be times when you're not looking at the parrot and don't realise it's providing you the body language and you get bitten by accident. Believe it or not, you're actually more likely to get bitten during hormone season or when the parrot is experiencing hormones. And something that genuinely surprises me is how many people do not expect our next topic. I have actually done a video on hormones previously and it's somewhere in the Quaffle vlog series. Personally, I think it's a bit cringy, I don't recommend it. But hormones do play an extremely important role in Pione's behaviour. Every time I see comments or posts on Facebook or YouTube or social media in general of people saying their Pionis is so sweet and innocent and has never bitten them. Nine times out of ten, those Pionis are under the age of two years old or they're a rescue over the age of ten with an experienced owner. Most people who have a Pionis parrot from the age of two years old up until maybe five have probably been bitten at least once. And this would have been purely down to hormones because just like teenagers, parrots go through puberty. All parrots have a period of time when their instincts start to kick in. Hormones are finally released from the body and they reach sexual maturity. And just like teenagers, when they go through puberty, the hormones when they're first released flush through the body like crazy and the birds are often overwhelmed by this new feeling, sensation and instinct. For Pionis parrot, they tend to reach maturity or puberty at around two to three years old. Some might be slightly earlier, some might be slightly later. But on average, it's usually between the ages of two and three. And again, just like teenagers, during this time their personality will start to change just a little bit. Because let's be honest, how many people do you know that were one way as a child, went through puberty and now are completely different either as a teenager or as an adult? When they first start going through their hormones, you will start to notice some more territorial behaviour, some nesty behaviour, behaviour, potentially some cage aggression due to the territorialness, and as expected this uncontrollable rage to protect their territory that they don't understand or can't control is what will most likely cause you to get bitten. It's actually during the stage that most parrot owners tend to struggle, especially if it's their first bird that they've had from a baby. And the reason a lot of people struggle is because this sweet innocent little baby that they've had for the last three months to two years, who has been so affectionate and loving and sweet and adorable, suddenly turns into a biting little feisty monster that wants to kill you from across the room, mood swings for days, and temper tantrums anytime you go near their cage. And it's why the most common question people ask at this age of a Pionis' life is why does my parrot suddenly hate me? The truth is they don't hate you or dislike you. You are still a flock member to them. They still see you as family. They just can't control the feelings that they're currently feeling. And just like a teenager lashes out at their parents, new birds lash out at their owners. If your Pionis parrot is between the age of two and three years old and you're noticing a massive personality change, the most important thing to remember is they can't control it. Their instincts and their hormones are in full swing and are constantly changing the mood and feeling of their body because their body is going through maturity. They aren't necessarily in control of their feelings, their moods or their actions because of that are quick and easy to anger. And this is also why learning your parrot's body language early on is extremely important as your knowledge of your parrot's body language will let you know when they're in grumpy teenage mode. It'll let you know when they are being territorial of their cage, when they are in feisty mode, when they are in grumpus mode. And that will let you know as the owner to keep your distance and give them their space until they calm down. Between the ages of two and three, your parrot will be adjusting to these new biomechanics going on in their body. And it is by far the hardest and worst time of a Pionis parrot's owner's life. But by the age of four years old, they will have fully settled in they would have been used to their hormones flushing their system twice every year, sometimes three times every year. They will have fully settled into their adult personalities. They will know their likes, their dislikes, what sets them off and what doesn't. And you will be able to predict it a lot easier because you will know your parrot so well by this point. I'll go into far more detail in a later video about hormones and how and why the hormones affect the parrots the way they do, or specifically Pionis parrots. Be aware that hormone season doesn't just go away. Just like women have cycles every single month, parrots have seasons. Hormone season tends to happen two to three times a year between 
approximately January, February down to late September. Quaffle has finally come out of hormone season and is only just settling down. However, by knowing these cycles and being able to predict your parrot's behavior during the season makes them a lot easier to handle when they do go through this stage. And they go back to their sweet little affectionate selves once hormone season is over. Or do they? I mean, are Pionis affectionate at all? Everywhere online says they're not affectionate and they're not cuddly birds. But are they? This is turning into a really long video. This is actually day two of recording, but the magic of YouTube, you guys are seeing it in all one day. And I'm definitely gonna break these points up at a later date to something a bit more. <laughs> all over social media, you will find people cuddling and snuggling their little macaws, cockatoos, and conyers. And when people ask Pionis owners, are Pionis cuddly? Majority of owners will say, no, but I also believe that this is down to a person's individual perception of what cuddly actually is. I, for example, would actually class a Pionus as a cuddly bird, but what is classed as cuddly for a Pionus is very different to what's classed as cuddly for a cuckoo for a cuckoo, for a cuckoo, for a cockatoo or a macaw. A pionus that truly loves and trusts its human will nearly always want to be around them, on them, by them or near them in some way, shape or form. Like Quaffle right now. In fact, I would go as far as to say that most pionus parrots are introverts. They have people that they like and they have people that they trust and it's these people that the pionus parrot will be cuddly with or do horny honks on the shoulder with. And just like any other introvert, they want cuddles on their own terms when they're ready for cuddles or to experience affection. One of the most obvious ways that a pionus is cuddly is that it will actually bow its head and fluff up its feathers asking for a head scratch. And this is one way to know whether or not a pionus trusts you because they don't ask for head scratches from just anybody. Some pionus will show cuddliness and affection by perching on your shoulder and cuddling into your neck or cuddling under your hair, like Lyra does with Jason. Good timing. And with both my girls, one of the ways that they actually enjoy cuddles is by sitting on our shoulders and smooshing their heads right into our faces. Quaffle's not in that mood right now. Quaffle's in excited mood right now. Lyra will full on snuggle into Jason. He will have her perch on his hand and she will literally smoosh into his neck while he gives her head scratches, which is actually quite rare for a Pionis to be that cuddly. Quaffle want head scratches? <laughs> No, Quaffle wants treats, Quaffle wants to train. Quaffle wants to train right now. You don't want head squitches, you want training. But this way of puffing their head feathers up, pressing into your face, and just generally wanting to be on your shoulder, that is a Pionis version of cuddliness. They don't want to be physically grabbed and cuddled and snuggled like Connies and Cockatoos do. They are more introverted and they like their own personal bubble. And if you get the privilege of entering that personal bubble, you are a very special person indeed. So in my opinion, yes, Pionis are cuddly. They just have their own version of cuddliness and they only allow people that they trust and love to experience that cuddliness and fussiness. Am I right? Like right now, Quaffle's actually asking me for head scratches by scratching her head. You change your mind? You wanna come up here? You wanna scratch this way? And this, this is actually a great example of a Pionis version of cuddliness right now. Perfect timing, my coffee. Yeah, you're perfect timing. You're very excited. No, we don't do the hornies. We don't do the hornies. Cuddles, fine. Hornies, no. Pionis parrots are generally rather loving and affectionate towards their preferred human. And they are rather sociable. For example, if a person is willing to interact with them and willing to get to know them, they are more likely to form a bond and a connection with that person, even if it's not their preferred human. However, all Pionis are different and some Pionis are very much one person birds. But it does also depend on how well you socialize or choose not to socialize your bird. And whether we like it or not, every bird has their preferred human. For Quaffle, that is me. For Lyra, that is my partner, Jason, AKA Shadow Human. So nicknamed Shadow Human because he likes to hide in the background and act a bit of a shadow behind the scenes. Which also annoys me a little bit because Bronzewing Pionis are my favorite type of Pionis parrots because of the different varieties of blues and colors in their feathers. And my bronze wing Pionis prefers my partner over me. And the challenge you've got to remember is not to take it to heart because Lyra still loves me. She still likes me. She still recalls to me. She still comes and spends time with me, still comes and sits with me. But if she has a choice between myself and my partner, she will always choose my partner. And that really hurts the heart when that is your favorite species and that parrot was meant to be for you. But just like people, you can't control who a parrot will bond to and attach to and prefer. And in my opinion, a parrot's bond to a person or whether or not they are sociable will depend completely on how well you socialize them, how much you encourage other people in the family to interact with them, or how well other people in the family are willing to interact with them. And you'll often find that they'll even play and play fight with 
people that they like. Which brings us on to our next topic. Just like many other types of parrot, Pyona's parrots are actually very, very playful and even quite clownish <laughs> and troublemakers when they want to be. As you can see, I've actually just got the treats out because the girls are desperate for some training time and Lyra is trying to steal the treats directly out of the tub. I'm watching you, Poppy. But yes, Pyona's parrots are rather playful creatures. They just prefer to sometimes play on their own. They quite happily will go and play with some of their favorite toys and their favorite treats or foraging toys or toys in general. White crowns especially love training, absolutely adore it. And because of this, you can get them to learn many different tricks. <laughs> and then you have bronze wings, which are cheeky, intelligent little rat bags and try to steal all the treats. I shouldn't have got the treats out during this recording. They're easy to train to recall. Flyer! Get off the top! Get off the top! No! No more top! No more top! Right, I'm gonna have to go get the, the thing. No! Stop stealing treats! Right, let's, let's go get let's go get the thing to stop you two from stealing. Hyona's parrots actually have a very, very soft and gentle beak. And unlike other parrots, it's not quite as strong as others. And because of this, they actually don't enjoy chewing on hardwood toys. Some do, but not many. Majority of Pyonas are actually quite content with playing or chewing on cardboard or soft wood, cork. And like I said, you can get them to learn multiple different tricks. Can you laugh? You'll be cheeky. Can you wave for me? Thank you for the wave. And as you can tell, they will do anything for pine nuts and almonds. Literally. Literally anything. Because of their soft beaks, they do prefer softer woods, softer cork, and things they can easily rip apart. Which is also a good point to make right here and now, is if you want a parrot, do not expect to have a clean and tidy house. They make a lot of mess, mainly from destroying their toys. All of my friends who have Conyers and Macaws and Cockatoos spend hundreds of pounds every month on toys for their birds in order to keep them entertained and stimulated because destruction and destruction of toys is a very important part of parrot play. They need to be able to exercise their beak. They need to be able to destroy something in some way, shape or form. So making sure you have toys that are appropriate for your individual parrot is just as important. Be queen! Yeah. My girls are quite happy with the latest Amazon box from a recent delivery, or the egg carton that we finished early in the week, or toilet rolls that we were about to throw in the recycling. These are really cheap and inexpensive toys that Pyona's parrots love. And nine times out of 10, you're gonna throw in the trash anyway. Might as well recycle them into parrot toys. And don't get me wrong, we still get them colorful and multicolored expensive toys now and again, but it's not necessary for their species. Colorful, playful toys are actually more appealing to the human eye. And even though the parrots are attracted to the colors, you can actually turn things these colors with food dye which makes them even cheaper and even more inexpensive. My girls love nothing more than climbing around, doing tricks, and munching on cardboard or lollipop sticks. Hey, that rhymes. So instead of actually buying expensive toys all the time, I'm currently trying to DIY my own toys made out of cardboard boxes, loo roll, and egg cartons, and similar things of the like that the girls just love to destroy. And like I said, when it comes to playtime, they do usually prefer to play on their own. That has actually given the Pyonus parrot another different stereotype, being independent. Pyonus parrots are known for being a very independent species, and this is true to an extent. They definitely have their own personal bubble and personal space they like to enjoy and have fun on. They like to play independently and on their own sometimes. And they usually sleep separately or nap separately during siesta time. And you'll usually find that most Pionus won't actually mind it if you leave the room for a short period of time. And even with other birds in the room, you'll often find them enjoying their own company, giving them this stereotype of being an independent bird. Because in that sense, they are. But Pyonus parrots are still parrots, they're still birds, and still find safety and security being part of a flock, even if that flock includes their humans, or is their humans. What happens when the owner needs to go to work? One of the reasons we actually got Lyra is because we noticed that when we had to leave for work, Quaffle was actually getting upset and didn't want to be left alone. When we were coming home from work, she was getting extremely excited and a little obsessed, getting very, 
very stressed anytime we did show the signs that we were about to leave. We even tried setting up a camera to see what it was she was getting up to while we were out at work. And sometimes she would have a play of her toys, sometimes she would go for a forage. But the majority of the time she would actually sit alone in the back of her cage or sit at the window staring out waiting for us to come home. And when we did eventually come home, she would fly to our shoulder and act like she hadn't seen us in weeks. We knew that she needed a companion, even if they didn't get on. The least we could ask for was that she wasn't alone. After knowing everything we did about different species, different genus, conyers, cockatoos, we decided that it would be best to stick within the Pionis genus. This is because all Pionis parrots share a similar body language, a similar way of communicating, and they can understand each other better. Birds of different genuses and different species have different ways of communicating. Because of that, it could have caused problems further down the line, so we wanted to play it safe and get a bird that they could easily communicate with. Hence, we ended up with Lyra. One of the biggest problems and one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest downsides we had of trying to find a second bird was Quaffle. Yeah, you! Because Quaffle is a white crown Pionus, it was going to be notoriously hard to get her to accept any bird. White crowns are known for being grumpier, more aggressive, and very territorial, and as a result, do not necessarily welcome other birds of other species, and even other white crown Pionus. They are very hard to mix. This has been found to be true for not just me, but multiple white crowned owners. Which meant no matter what bird we got of whatever species we got, we could only hope and pray that Squaffle would be willing to tolerate them at best. Hopefully eventually one day get on with them, but there was always going to be that possibility that they were never going to get on and they were always going to be natural enemies. You can't physically predict nor control whether or not a bird is going to like another bird. And this was one of the challenges we we had in the very beginning. But that's one of the things that's unique to white crown Pionis parrots compared to other Pionis species, is that cheeky, feisty, sassy nature. And that's not the only thing that makes Pionis parrots unique. There are traits that are unique to Pionis parrots specifically that you may or may not find in a lot of other species of parrots. One of those unique traits is the Pionis strut. You're most likely to see the Pionis strut in a hormonal male or female Pionis. And the males and females actually strut quite differently. When a male Pionis parrot struts, they tend to stand very, very tall. They usually have all their feathers standing out on end, a full fan tail, and they usually have their wings ever so slightly ajar as they then parade around their cage in a very, very territorial manner to let everyone know that this is their domain and no one may enter. The females actually have a very similar strut and we have shared this before when Quaffle's done it. When the females strut, they tend to go a lot lower and their body tends to be more parallel. Their head feathers and their back feathers tend to go on end, but they tend to keep their wings tucked inside and their tail still fans at full. Their beak will separate slightly and you will see them doing that same pacing. It'll be slightly more quicker than the males. It'll be more of a pacing territory, this is my ground, this is my nest, do not come near it. Usually when they present this strutting behaviour it's because they are being territorial over their cage or nesting area. Quaffle, for example, likes to strut when she's on her bed cage and on the shower for some reason. She does tend to strut on the shower, we're not too sure why. Lyra, we've only so far seen strutting once and this was actually on our living room door and I am so gutted I didn't get it on camera because it was one of the funniest things I have ever seen in my life. This sweet sweet, sweet, placid little natured girl suddenly going all floof and aggressive going and along the door was hilarious. Again, you're most likely to see this strut during hormone season or breeding season and be aware that if you see this strut, this is the time that you are most likely going to get bitten by your Pionis parrot. Pionis parrots are naturally more aggressive during hormone season. It is a vital essence to survival in the wild in order to protect their nest and their partner and their eggs. Another unique Pionis parrot behaviour which to our knowledge is very unique to Pionis and sends so many new owners into a full on panic thinking their bird is ill is the Pionis wheeze. And it is this very sound that actually gives Pionis parrots the nickname of the little pigs or piggy parrot. It is a huff puffing sound that they usually make when they are either extremely happy or very nervous. Due to Quaffle's camera aggressive tendencies, I do only have a few examples of this Pionis wheeze in action, both the happy and the nervous version, which I will insert now to give you guys an idea of what it sounds and looks like. The 
puff puffing sound does have a very minor difference in the noise, but it's so small and minor that many people can't tell the difference. The best way to tell the difference between whether or not the wheeze is excited wheezing or nervous wheezing is to watch the body language. The body language will tell you a lot. If they are showing nervous body language, they are puffed up angrily, they're leaning away or trying to stay away from something or moving away from something, this is a nervous pionus wheeze. Something has got their attention that's making them nervous. Quaffle sometimes exhibits this behaviour around her bed cage when there's something she's trying to get away and threaten and try and bite and she can't reach it or can't get away from it, she'll then start doing the nervous wheeze because she is nervous that there's a potential threat near her bed and she doesn't know how to deal with it. They will also do this wheeze when they are very happy. In fact, nine times out of ten, Quaffle does this wheeze when she's on my shoulder and I'm giving her head scratches. Not horny honks. Which is actually really cute because they end up puff puffing down your ear and it's this weirdest and sweetest little noise. It really is. But they are usually very, 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 very happy when they've made this noise. We've been cuddly. We've been cuddly and struggling. Okay. Now the Pionis wheeze does panic a lot of new owners because it makes them believe or think that their bird is ill or has some sort of respiratory illness. And that's just not the case. This is just a trait that is unique to Pionis parrots. So if you already own or you are a new owner or you're planning to become an owner of a Pionis parrot, get to know what the wheeze sounds like because the wheeze does sound different to an actual respiratory illness or a respiratory problem or blockage of the airways. If in doubt, ask if your parrot is making any form of noise that doesn't quite sound like the wheeze or maybe even it does sound like the wheeze but there's other factors such as a runny nose or they're a little out of character if in doubt always ask an avian veterinarian and make sure it's an avian veterinary specialist so that they know what they're doing and what to look out for when it comes to parrots so many exotic vets out there specialize in reptiles and small animals it's very very hard to find an avian specialist vet but they are so important to the health and care of your parrot if you have made it to this point in the video first of all thank you very very much for watching all the way through it is very grateful and very reassuring to us that people want to learn more about these unusual and amazing amazing little species. If you have enjoyed this video and find it useful in any way, shape or form, please don't forget to give us a like and maybe give us a comment below. What was your favourite part of the video? Or was there anything you learned that you didn't know before? Maybe you just enjoyed Quaffle and Lyra's antics through the video. And if you do leave us a comment, we do try and reply to every single comment that we get. It's not always possible, but so far we've managed to respond to about 95% of comments regularly. So if you do want to leave a comment, feel free to ask a question. We're always willing to try and help new Pionis owners or new parrot owners in general that are still learning about their birds and want to learn more. Or if it is Pionis parrots specifically that you're looking for information for, consider subscribing to our channel. We are hoping to make more education educational videos like this, including going more in depth to each and every topic that we have covered today. We love getting to know our subscribers and our followers and it is wonderful to know that so many people want the best care for their Pionis parrots. And if you do choose to subscribe, don't forget to click that notification bell to make sure that you know as soon as one of our new videos are uploaded. We are hoping to make a lot more educational videos on Pionis parrots as a species. Our next educational video is going to be on the eight different types of Pionis parrot species and how to identify them, which is something that a lot of people apparently really struggle with. If our next educational video isn't out yet, why not go check out some of our vlogs? We do try and provide some kind of informative information throughout our vlog videos, and we've had several people tell us that they have learnt information just from watching our vlogs. But from me and the girls, bye bye! The Pionis Parrot. Will you stop squeaking when I'm trying to talk? I'm gonna have to, oh, I can't. Mm -hmm. Why is my head cutting off? My head cutting off, I don't like it. But the main giveaway that a parrot is part of the Pionis genus. But are these short, podgy little birds really as beautiful and amazing as they claim? What am I saying? I don't know. <laughs> Now I am going to go into more detail on a different video. <laughs> In a different video at a later date. They are a difficult species to breed. Something I did find very interesting. Making a mess there. Cough is cooey. I just know it's in the background. And it's driving me crappy. I'm gonna cry. About. Alright, alright. Come on then. Something shorter and easier to, you know. There's something. I'm definitely gonna shorten these points at a later date to bigger it to other. I'm gonna try and say it, Lara. 
We're not going back out for a fly yet. Dusky owners that I know of. What are you doing, Huffle? And even though Pyona's parrots are generally quiet. Quiet! I said quiet! You're doing it again! Being energetic. Huffle, can you squeeze? And one of the ways they actually use these calls is to identify. Stop! Actually, can't stand the t <laughs> the volume of the Piona shriek. I'm definitely going to make videos at a later date with other points. Right now, Cuffle's getting ready to dance. She's getting excited. We're getting excited. Yeah, getting excited. But I also believe that this is all Cuffle off. You say it too, Lyra. Bless you. Yeah, yeah, you're you're doing lots of laughing. This is not working. Off and leave me again. Can we do wings? I own this parrot. My girls will quite happily chew on the latest box. They definitely have their own. Ugh, girls, will you stop flying around? White crowns. Thanks for the poop. My girls are quite happily. Our next educational video is actually going to be on the eight different type. Yeah. Again? Again? Do the wings again? That was good wings. Well done.